Hey, great, thanks. Um, really excited to visit with everybody this afternoon. Um, Jeremy and I, we've really had a nice, uh, I guess, collection of ideas and discussions for the greater part of a year on something that seems to connect us all, and that's woodland expansion. And there's just not many threats that, that seem to fall under uh, something that big where, where no matter where we are in our own geographies, uh, we are dealing with the issue of woody encroachment. This is something that, that I've studied for my entire career and had a really nice opportunity to talk with rangeland ecologists elsewhere. Um, so I'm an associate professor at the University of Nebraska. I did my graduate training at Oklahoma State and Texas A&M, and I still have active research from Texas all the way up through Nebraska um, and continuing to expand that deals with the issue of how we better sustain access to woody encroachment. So uh, it's something that's kind of near and dear. I've, I think looking back, I've, I've really appreciated that I've had the rare opportunity to spend, you know, so much time across a huge geography, because usually as professors, we often get pushed somewhere else. And we actually get, uh, get asked to, to leave the region. So it's really nice being able to have this local expertise, and I've, I've just been able to experience a bunch of our bio. Um, with that, Jeremy, you want to you introduce yourself as well and give a little background? Yeah, absolutely. Um, hey, everybody. Jeremy Maestas here. I'm an ecologist with the NRCS, West National Technology Support Center, and uh, uh, based in Oregon. Um, really excited to be doing this here with you today. We've just got a, some really tremendous lessons learned over a decade of doing this and, and stealing good ideas from a lot of other people. And so we're happy to share those here with you today. We've got a great team of scientists that have been brought together. And we've got more clarity on these issues than I've ever seen in my career. Um, so my background, I'm a wildlife biologist by training, but uh, kind of a uh, adopted rangeland ecologist, per se. I've, I've worked on rangelands my whole career um, in the Intermountain West and uh, really have focused on that the last five or six years especially in this role um, where I work to bridge that science to implementation gap. So I work with our science team and help our staff put those, um, that new information into practice. So that's kind of my niche and role here. And you're gonna hear a lot from me over the next uh, day and a half here. So um, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and launch into our first of this uh, kind of rolling up our sleeves series on, on strategies for reducing these threats. So we got about an hour and a half or so. Again, we'll try to keep it fairly interactive between Dirac and I. Please ask questions in the chat box and we'll, um, we'll have lots of time for discussion of those things. But here's where we're heading. I wanna start with a little background on the threat, why it's a problem. Uh, lay out some of the strategies for tackling this threat and examples of successful strategies and some of the outcomes that have resulted from that. We'll also cover the primary practices and NRCS programs that we're using. And then finally, some step-by-step -step strategy building and the available spatial data that you might have at your fingertips to help with this uh, area-wide planning exercise. So with that, Dirac, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Great, thanks. Well, uh, I've had the pleasure to talk to a number of producer groups, conservation groups, uh, other scientists, and I'm more and more just starting with this foundation and, and this level of, of conclusion. And, and I don't make it lightly as a scientist, but Woody expansion and woody encroachment is a national rangeland crisis. Uh, scientists have been saying it for a long time. It's, uh, it's been a huge issue and, and it's been one of the big unsolved problems of the range profession. And I think this is a good point to step back and say, you know, look, there, there is an absolute reason we're gonna spend an hour and a half talking about this today. Uh, it's no accident that we are leading with woody expansion over other threats. Um, it is that important. Uh, just, just look at this, these sets of maps 
where threats are associated with a, a functional group tied to vegetation. So here are these five functional groups that, that are showcased on the rangeland analysis platform. And, and I've got to tell you, as a, as a researcher, I've been waiting for platforms that could give me annual information of vegetation data for huge geographies. So we could look at true scales of problems in rangelands and get that information every year and not tell me if something's grassland or not, but give me continuous data coverage. That's finally something more like the weather. And so when we can monitor the weather of rangelands and our vegetation, this tells us, you know, where our threats are lying and, and what some of the challenges and problems are. And, and if you look at these, every single dot that you see that's blue is an area that for a particular functional group has an increasing trend since 1999 to 2018. So just look at all the blue of trees in that upper right hand uh, image and then compare that to the very little red. And then just go down to the bottom where we've highlighted that for you. We are talking about that trees have shown an increasing trend on almost 120 million acres of our Western rangelands. They are increasing the most compared to any other functional group by far. They are also decreasing the least compared to any other functional group. So we are absolutely getting our lunch eaten when it comes to woody plant encroachment. Uh, and it's one of those that's a challenge because it occurs more slowly, right? The, the lifespan of trees is very different than other uh, types of vegetation. It's growth rate, how it recovers, how it invades, how it spreads. So it's this slower process, a slower threat. But this just shows us over the course of 20 years across the Western US, how big of a problem woody encroachment has become. And I often say in groups that the clock's ticking. Uh, the clock's ticking fast before we're just living with a very different reality than what we've had in the past. So, so I hope that, that as we go through this today, we start talking about different principles of how to attack it. But one of the biggest things to recognize then is, okay, what are we going to do about it, given that this is the functional group increasing more than any other? And think about, you know, as I'm hearing these team discussions this morning and others, are we putting our science, are we putting our practices, are we putting our investments in the right places to deal with this threat, given that we can now see it, track it, and showcase the big issue that it really is. Um, so so this, is, this is the issue, and, and we're not alone. Every continent in the world is having a woody encroachment problem for our rangelands. So, so this is one of these just global issues and I think that the opportunity ahead of us is that this team can do something about it. So there's my initial speech going in. Let's keep going, Jeremy, and we'll, we'll dive deeper into this issue. All right, one thing I've been preaching more and more in uh, different groups tied to the science that's out there on rangelands is that we've communicated this as a very local problem uh, nationally to our leadership. Um, we've communicated the issues of mesquite, of different species out in the Intermountain West, of Eastern Red Cedar, or Ash Juniper. But in reality, we have a woody encroachment issue. It's just a different species that connects Nebraska to Oregon, to Utah, to Texas. It's a different species that's removing uh, land area tied to our rangeland resources. And there's been decades of research on the impacts, but the success stories we have are few and far between compared to many other threats. So, so how do we get there? How do we build more success stories? And how do we start to, to learn from each other? I think that's something Jeremy and I are really excited about. We're learning more and more as we continue to break down the barriers of our geography. Think of, of working lands and wildlife in terms of how to better deal with encroachment from each other and, and start connecting producers on the ground, um, not only from like Oregon and Utah, but connecting stories with Kansas Nebraska, Oklahoma, and so forth. We're, we're just advancing the learning on how to better deal with this issue as we look at it as more of a national issue. We all just have a different species in our backyard that seems to be threatening our resources. All right, next slide. Of course, the wildlife story is very well known. Um, here in the Great Plains, there's, there's been uh, 70 years of research on wildlife uh, impacts to 
eastern red cedar and other encroaching woody species. Same story for the Intermountain West. So people have been studying this for a long time. And I really like these two data figures because we know how sensitive our wildlife are to early levels of encroachment. And that's so important to recognize that how fast we lose some of our most iconic species. So we just don't have uh, lack activity of sage grouse when we get higher than you know four percent cover. Look at the look at this data; it completely falls off uh, in terms of their probability of lack activity after you reach four percent. And these are associated with larger scales of change. So we're talking about very low density, low spread of trees that traditionally we don't even think of as a problem. Well, the same story occurs for lesser prairie chickens. Our relative probability of use crashes with very low densities of trees. Look at that, two trees per hectare is all it takes and we start seeing that crash of probability of use. So our grassland wildlife, just like we were talking about earlier, our rangeland wildlife, require big intact rangelands. And that's been our challenge with woody encroachment. Woody encroachment fragments our rangelands. Uh, there's new research out of Nebraska even showing that uh, you know, greater prairie chickens being more sensitive to low density trees than they are of energy development. So low density trees, they're more sensitive than low pressure from energy. So, so are we giving trees the same level of, of attention in terms of trying to prevent them coming in, really compromising our wildlife habitat? And, and think of that, when do we respond on these curves? Do we respond to protect our intact rangelands and protect them and avoid compromising their habitats? Or do we wait until we get to the bottom of that hockey stick to put in our investments? And then we show an increase after treatments, hopefully, because we already lost that. So, so the more that we can start to get ahead of the challenge and think spatially, uh, understand how to put strategies and principles to scale, the more that we can avoid these types of declines. Uh, there's your teaser for later. And, and it's not just these two. We know that this is such an issue for our rangeland uh, wildlife with other species. Uh, this is just an example that, uh, that are some of the iconic ones. All right, let's keep going. Now, now with woody encroachment, it's the double whammy. If, if you think of those pictures, it had energy development, agriculture, other kind of things we talk about as conversions, those are often purposeful. And so we're doing them often for particular reasons and there's a major trade off to our rangelands, but woody encroachment is not purposeful. Woody encroachment is happening and it doesn't just affect our wildlife. It doesn't just take land out of wildlife habitat for our rangelands. It takes land out of agricultural production. And this is a really important result that we see all the time in the Great Plains. Uh, this is long-term data from the Edwards Plateau of Texas, whereas with years of juniper invasion, you see this crash of livestock production potential. That's a 75% decline in livestock production potential as a result of this. That's, these are people's livelihoods. And remember, in the Great Plains, these are our most productive uh, uh, cattle-based rangeland livelihoods. So also I'd like to point out, think of how much emphasis we put on the shock of drought. So, so you see that variability from year to year when you initially have juniper coming in, that's the impact of drought. Drought doesn't matter if you're covered with juniper trees. The variability of drought no longer matters because there's so little left anyways. So, so think of how many programs and how many things we put into drought we're talking about a 75% decline that's permanent with juniper species here in the Great Plains. Drought is impermanent. Drought is short-term by definition. So, so this, is a, this is the big issue. This is the big one that affects our wildlife. It's the big one that's affecting our uh, cattle operations. And, uh, and this is what we're up against. All right, next slide. Now I've alluded to some of the impacts tied to, you know, our iconic wildlife species and our cattle based operations and our and rancher livelihoods. But it's something that that has been really a bigger focus tied to what we know about outcomes. So this morning you heard a lot about how do we quantify outcomes. Well, on this issue, we know what's at risk. 
Um, it doesn't matter if, if you care about cattle or if you care about prairie chickens uh, or if you care about American endangered bearing beetles or pollinators or grassland biodiversity. Maybe you care about large ungulates that require rangeland to be more intact or water resources that are connected to declines with encroachment. Maybe you wanna prevent wildfire problem from growing to the Great Plains because juniper species are our most volatile fuels and we tend to plant them next to houses. Or maybe you care about social programs like school funding, uh, which has a million acres of grazing leased land in Nebraska alone. And there's school trust lands in South Dakota, Oklahoma, Texas, where woody encroachment takes land out of agricultural production and that leads to reduced funding where all the profits from those trusts go to fund public education in our metro areas like Lincoln and Omaha here in Nebraska. This is the story of rangelands that we haven't told as well. This is why having rangelands intact is so important. And this is what woody encroachment poses as a risk. Uh, what we wanna have is not the, the story of, of what we're seeing that's declining or the story of what we're losing. We wanna start moving towards the story of, of what we're winning and, and where are those success stories and what are we seeing that's the benefit of our management actions, the benefit of taxpayer dollars towards investing in conifer management, um, and the benefit to our wildlife and really our way of life on rangelands. So I appreciate everyone, you know, for really trying to rally the troops on this issue as we try and move forward and protect what rangelands really mean to us. Next slide. And so we've, we've thought about this a lot in terms of of why given the risks, why given all the data and what's at stake, have we not you know, responded earlier? Why have we not gotten ahead of this threat? And, and there's even a lot of scientists who have spent their career studying this that said, ah, it's just a, this is a social problem. We need no more ecological data. This is just a social problem and one of, of cultural will of rangelands. And, and part of that comes to how we undervalue slow changes that slowly erode. Our, our mind just doesn't capture how vegetation is changing slowly over decades. So this is actually a picture of, of Nebraska. This is, this is the Les Canyons of Nebraska. I'm gonna go into it in more detail, but just check out 1950s versus today. This is something that Scott Morford uh, put together. He's working with part of that science team at University of Montana. And just, just look at the change. Uh, this is something that we just struggle to rationalize. Even if we played this out year by year, we, in, a, in kind of a movie setting, our mind tends to reset the baseline. And so the abnormal becomes the new normal. And we rationalize that the trees have always been there. So, so this, this rate of this happening over our lifetime makes this a really problematic threat. And Scientists globally continue to say that the big threats are not these short punctuated threats. Resilience of our ecosystems are compromised by these slow changes over time. These are the big threats to the resilience of our system. Woody encroachment. Next slide. So, so that's your backdrop from the science end. I think uh, this is a great point to turn it over, let Jeremy, you know, you want to give some of your expertise on just how we try and tackle it, the why, and, and how we've tried to approach it traditionally. So I'll turn it back over to you. Perfect, thanks, Rock. Uh, that was a great setup. And uh, the thing that just constantly blows me away is the commonalities. You know, I've worked most of my career in the Intermountain West, had my blinders on until I met Duroc, started learning about the issues in the plains. We know the same issues are happening in the desert Southwest. And so this is truly one of those um, uniting threats that um, we can all be a part of helping to solve. So I'm going to talk shift gears and kind of talk a little more about the background of the practices we use and some of the, the new thought processes on how to maybe um, get our arms around this. Um, so the primary workhorse practices that we're, we're talking about traditionally being used, brush management, prescribed burning, uh, brush management incorporates a variety of different mechanical types of treatments, um, chemical primarily. Um, and so these are go going to be the, the main tools we're talking about throughout this presentation. And if you just reflect um, for a moment, 
on the past, it's really important for us to chart a, a more effective path forward. And this isn't a criticism of what we've done in the past. It's more of just trying to learn and adapt and be better, more effective. Um, in general, we tend to focus on the right-hand side of this graph on the curve where invasions are already advanced and pretty bad. Um, we tend to wait too long and therefore the cost of what we have to do goes up. We have to get really aggressive in terms of our treatments. And uh, this has played out fairly well with the farm bill payments. If you look at regionally, um, you know, we've spent the most money on brush management uh, kind of in that epicenter in the Southern Plains trying to fight our way out of a really bad brush management problem. Uh, meanwhile, other regions that we know are vulnerable and maybe just not as far along, um, you know, we haven't seen that similar type of investment. And so that's part of the conversation we want to have here is, um, you know, balancing that so that we have uh, equal urgency placed on some of these other regions that are earlier on that invasion curve. Again, if we reflect on where we usually work versus where we should, um, we often wait too long to address resource concerns, deferring management until problems are obvious. However, if we take lessons learned from Invasive Species Management 101, we know that addressing these issues proactively before they come bad is uh, not only more cost efficient, but it's more effective than a wait and react approach. We also know that landscape context we choose to work in matters a lot. And if you take a look at the uh, figures here on the right, it kind of illustrates that. Uh, the first uh, is a landscape where we're managing small problems, those red boxes, in a sea of otherwise intact landscape. The other extreme is we're trying to save a few small islands in a sea of degradation. Which one of these do you think we're going to be more effective in? And of course, that reactive approach also has implications for our practice lifespans. So in NRCS, we talk about practice lifespans and expectation management. Um, here's some research out of uh, Duroc's lab. They um, followed what happened uh, with cedar reinvasion after a wildfire. And the sites that were already woodlands prior to the fire came back within just a couple of years after that wildfire versus sites that were previously in that grassland state. It took 15 years or more for those trees to, to come back in or start making their way that direction. So, you know, we have all kinds of anecdotes uh, when we talk about brush management across the West of, you know, it comes right back. Well, some of that depends on what it was before and the memory of that site, you know, and the seed bank that's, that was there that was never really addressed. And so these are concepts that we want to keep in mind going forward. From a ground-based perspective, we have a pretty good understanding of the woody encroachment process, but sometimes our traditional management paradigm prevents us from taking a truly proactive approach. For example, when would we even recognize this as being a resource concern in, in NRCS? You know, I've heard instances around the country of uh, us or our partners maybe setting specific canopy cover thresholds where we won't even engage in addressing this until it reaches some percentage uh, of a problem. But we know that we probably need to get on it the minute that seed source starts to show up in the area. That's our most uh, effective leverage point and uh, part of where we would like to start to shift an emphasis on management. If we bring all these concepts together, what we're realizing is that what's needed is really a proactive and spatially explicit strategy actually solve this persistent threat. Now, if we borrow an analogy from the medical field, we know that preventative care designed to treat disease early is much more effective than waiting until the problem is advanced and requiring emergency care. 
too often our management of these threats can be characterized as simply chasing the ambulance. And threats don't occur randomly on the landscape. So we can use our local knowledge along with new technology and spatial data to help us identify where are these remaining intact uh, landscape cores and then devise strategies to defend and grow those cores over time. The arrows on this figure kind of lay out that preferred direction of management if we have a choice. But if we only focus on the threat, we may not achieve all of the outcomes that we want. We've seen the most success for conserving both rancher and wildlife values when we find that quote sweet spot to address threats where intact but vulnerable landscape cores intersect with our wildlife strongholds and the local cultural will to take action. This is a figure Tim introduced this morning and you're going to see this a lot throughout the rest of the day and a half as we think this kind of mental model helps frame up um, what we're trying to achieve. Because that sweet spot is precisely where Working Lands for Wildlife seeks to focus our conservation delivery. So a primary task for our, our NRCS staff here today and our partners who've joined us um, is really to help identify where do these opportunities exist in your states. So I'm gonna turn this back over now to Duroc and Duroc's gonna walk us through, we're gonna break this down by biome and we're gonna give you some very specific examples of people actually implementing and identifying those priority areas, implementing these types of strategies. Great, thanks, Jeremy. So, so I love the, I love this picture. I mean, I just, we've, we've thrown a little bit of stuff at you, but just, just look at this picture because this is how we, we see the world. Uh, this is how we view our, our rangeland systems, right? It's how we look at the world with our own two eyes. So we, we tend to think of our environment no different than any other species at a, at a certain range of scales. And this is the range that we look at it. We, we tend to treat individual trees, tend to treat individual patches, and we kind of have this small scale landscape view. So, so keep this in mind as we're thinking about how we interpret change. And, but I want to back zoom everyone out to this, uh, to what the biome actually looks like for the Great Plains. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at that, Jeremy. So, uh, so as we start thinking about our biome, one of the, one of the coolest things for me, uh, who as a professor has, has the opportunity to travel to see different grasslands across the world and, and spending so much time from Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, and elsewhere, I just really appreciate when I see large intact grasslands that are left. And so here are your last big grasslands uh, within the Great Plains. And a postdoc in my lab, Reinhard Schultz, he has completed a global analysis looking at the relative intactness of uh, grasslands, which are shown here in this data uh, figure in the upper right, and then our, our uh, shrub steps. And, and so just look at this figure and watch as I go through it and think about how iconic all these are. Uh, the Great Plains still has some of the most intact grasslands remaining in the world. So we're talking about the Nebraska Sandhills was number one most intact grassland true prairie in the world in 2000. Now it's number two. But it's right next to the Serengeti volcanic grasslands, some of the most intact kind of nomadic classic uh, African wildlife that we think of. And the other one in the top three is the Mongolian Manchurian grasslands with this incredible history and culture that, uh, that is talked about and just this, these are our romanticized grassland regions. And look at number four, Flint Hills tall grasslands. And you can see that in that Eastern portion of Kansas, the last remaining tall grass prairie eco region left in North America. And that's what it looks like today. Uh, finally, your northern short grasslands, your western short grasslands. We have four of the top seven 
remaining uh, in the world for our true grassland ecosystems. And that's where they, what they look like. Now notice here on this graph too, once we get out down after those, every other of, of our big grassland regions of the world have less than 50% of them intact. So that's how much grasslands have been converted and have been changed. And the other challenge we have is that in, look at which ones are the most converted in the world. So at the very bottom of that upper right hand graph, northern tall grasslands and central tall grasslands. Well, that's why you don't see any colors in eastern Nebraska going on up through the rest of the tall grass prairie, right? They've already been converted and less than 1% of them are remaining. So, so we've got this really interesting cultural challenge in the Great Plains where we have some of the most intact grassland regions remaining in the world right next to the most converted grassland regions in the world. Uh, that's a little bit different than our shrub steppes, which by the way, the one that tops the list is the Wyoming Basin Shrub Step. And all this is just based on how these groups defined them, but this incredible legacy that's still intact and that can be conserved. The challenge is that where agriculture hasn't changed them in the past, you can see what woody encroachment uh, looks like. These are all the areas in the red where we have at least 5% uh, tree cover values with the rangeland analysis platform. Everywhere that's green, less than 5%, that's what gave this kind of grassland image. All right, let's go to the next slide. So we can use the rangeland analysis platform and we can take the perennial uh, functional group and the tree functional group. And we can start leveraging new early warning indicators that are built out of resilient science. So one of the cool things happening in Nebraska is we're actually starting a center for resilience that I'm part of at the University of Nebraska. And part of it is being able to apply advances in resilience to uh, what we're trying to do with conservation planning and implementation of, of conservation and understanding how resilience is changing. So these early warning indicators are a big deal and we can show you the boundary of a biome. So on this western edge, of course, the reason the Great Plains stops there is that's where the Rocky Mountains start. And this eastern side is where you get trees dominating over grassland. Everywhere green is more that grassland dominated system. So you can see this picture of the sand hills there. Well, right next to where that line ends in Nebraska, you see that little yellow and reddish haze right in the middle of the sand hills? Well, 100 years ago, uh, we planted a, the largest hand planted forest in the world at the time, uh, Halsey uh, National Forest. It's managed by the US Forest Service right now. And we planted it and it's full of cedar trees. So, Everywhere that looks red looks more like Halsey than it does like our grasslands. Everywhere that's yellow is given that warning signal of, of where that system's changing. And I just want to step through this because where do we put our investments? Based on what Jeremy was talking about, real producer costs, when I'm talking to them across the plains, you know, in the sand hills, it might be $150 per acre right now. But in South Central Kansas, ranchers are telling me it's up to $1,000 per acre. So we're talking about a huge amount of investments if we wait to act. And so we want to prevent biomes from changing. I mean, we're not talking about these pictures where a landscape is changing. Now we're talking about scientists are studying the collapses of biomes. So here's this leading edge where trees are dominating over grasses. Let's see how that's changing now uh, over time. So that's 2000 and let's jump over to 2018. So that's how far it's moved. Our biome, the leading edge of our biome is moving. You can actually see the outline of the Flint Hills, the only place that even made that flinch. So I think of this like, like a Looney Tunes cartoon where termites are running through you know, a little village and just eating everything up. Like somehow one house escaped the termite attack that buzzsawed right through the village. Uh, well, to do that, take, it took 2 million acres burning about every year to make the biome signal flinch. And now the Flint Hills has more pressure than they've ever had before. We now have warning signals expanding to the sand hills of Nebraska, Missouri River Corridor of South Dakota. And because of the technology, we can zoom in on these areas and really start to understand that this signal is telling you your resilience is eroding. Even if you have grasslands in red, 
they're surrounded by woody plant pressure. They're surrounded by propagules. You've got that one blue pixel in a sea of red. You have to manage it more now and into the next decade than you had to manage it in the past to keep it. So this, this is no longer static. We've implemented controls as if our biome was fixed, as if it was at equilibrium. It is not stable. Our, our system is crashing. Uh, collapsing building. How are we gonna hold up that building? Are we gonna do it by waiting until it crashes and rebuilding it block by block? Uh, that seems to be the chasing transitions we've done in the past. So, so many of our investments are in the red. And the reason I'm showing you this is because usually when this happens at this scale, scientists refer to this as an irreversible change. We, there's no evidence that we will chase transitions at a biome scale and restore this level of change. So how do we start to reinvest to be more proactive? This is not a local problem anymore, like when we started some of our brush management paradigms half a century ago. We have multi-state issues spanning how we're trying to protect rangeland. So just to me, this is so important to recognize, like these signals tell you where that leading edge is. Uh, it's not just random cover or random amount of trees. We're talking about severe displacement of our system to an entirely different alternative state. We can now show you where that's occurring. All right, let's go to the next one. So even though all that's happening, the big challenge we have ahead of us then is, well, how do we scale up conservation success? How do we go from managing individual trees, from managing individual patches of trees and starting to think about how do we protect our intact rangeland resources? And how do we start to push back against the war on, on things like cedar? So that was one of the things that really started driving some of our program here at Nebraska scientists had talked and, and documented the declines of, of different rangeland resources with woody encroachment all throughout western rangelands. Well, how do we start to showcase what success looks like? And, and so this is the story of the Les Canyons. Pictured here is Scott Stout, and, and I can only tell the story that I hear from ranchers in this area, where basically uh, around 2005 or so, Groups came together and said, look, we've got a, a huge problem here. We're, our livelihoods and our cattle operations, which form you know, what this region is all about for, uh, for the people that live there, they're under severe attack, right? That 80% threat to their livelihood. Um, they've heard the stories that are coming from Texas and Oklahoma on how the problem can get even worse than what you see in that picture. So what are we going to do about it? Uh, at the same time, you have an endangered American bearing beetle in that landscape with uh, research that was coming out of uh, Nebraska Game and Parks and, and T.J. Walker, where, where you actually start to uh, understand that they avoid uh, areas more dominated by cedar. So we've kind of got a common vision or a common trust that's starting to be talked about in the middle of the 2005 type of decade. And, and that started you know, getting groups talking, like how can we actually start to scale this up? Our history of brush management in place like Nebraska, we, we managed it at 20 to 40 acres at a time. So this group started to say, well, that's not gonna help the beetle. That's not gonna help our rancher livelihoods. And so you get this partnership starting to form. And the three names that keep coming up over and over again is, is Game and Parks, Pheasants Forever, and NRCS. Key individuals trying to think differently about how to tackle this issue. So, so look at that upper right figure, because I think it really describes what's going on here. We've got wildlife strongholds, uh, but they didn't have data on it yet. They didn't have long-term data. That started after this, this really ramped up. Uh, they didn't have information on where their landscape was more intact, right? They just saw the system this way and they knew what the threats were. So, so they didn't let any of that stuff, you heard Brady this morning say, don't let, you know, science or the lack thereof get in your way. What this group had was a common interest and cultural will that they wanted to build. And that's what happened in this landscape. Like watch what happens with cultural will. Next slide. So, so Nebraska, when I came here, I learned a whole lot about their state wildlife action plan. And I just love this broader map. Um, 
the state wildlife action plan, this is where priority areas for wildlife and uh, these, they call them biolog biologically unique landscapes. That's what's shown here in, in green. Um, and this is, this is done to try and figure out where are we going to prioritize investments because these areas are so important for uh, different wildlife species in Nebraska. And, and the less canyons you can see there in the south central portion of the state. Uh, you know, th this was the area that when I've, we've studied each one of these now in terms of how they've changed. This one, one area, what makes it so unique was the culture that's been built up. That region's a 330,000 acre region. Uh, landowners that were coming together over time, and we're talking just, you know, now it's 15 short years. Landowners have come together to help manage each other's lands, you know, where they use things like mechanical removal to support prescribed fire. They, they have an entire fleet of prescribed fire equipment that rivals any volunteer fire department in the state. They have the most experience with prescribed fire. They've actually helped start groups like a landowner-led Nebraska Prescribed Fire Council. Um, they, this culture has impacted more than the Les Canyons, but they now own, as part of collaborative landowner coalition, 200,000 acres plus of the 330,000 acre ecoregion. To me, like that's an incredible amount of cultural will that was built up in a short period of time. And it has this great link of wildlife and intact landscapes. Next slide. So here's what it looked like in 2000. Take that picture on the right um, and you can see this kind of landscape view of where it's more uh, cedar dominated to a more sparse spread. And look at this area of 2000. Everywhere red looks more cedar dominated. Everywhere in the blue is more dominated by grassland. And you can see where this boundary generally exists between those two ecological states. So let's just play this out over time. So that's what 2000 looks like. There's 2005, right? You're seeing the expansion of, of cedar throughout the region. And then watch this jump from 2010. Right? The cedars are winning. The same story we see throughout so much of the Great Plains. And then 2015 starts to hit. And all of a sudden you see a halting of that boundary. 2016, 2017, 2018. When I show this throughout the Great Plains to different landowner groups, the quote I keep hearing is that finally somebody's winning the war against Eastern Red Cedar. I mean, this is the first evidence I've seen where, where groups changed how they managed after cedar became a huge regional problem and actually halted the transition. It didn't just stabilize the system, they've halted the boundary. And, and I'll tell you, this is the only group not impressed are the landowners here. They, this is not quite where they want this system, right? It's not as productive as they want to be. So look at this next slide and you'll see where they've managed. This is where they have 80,000 acres of private lands management. Uh, they're now over 100,000 acres. These, they've scaled up conservation to deal with the true scale of the threat. They've operated at the boundary, not in the red. All the things that we've learned now, this is an example of why this can work better. And I'll tell you, they just wish they'd started earlier. They keep saying that over and over again. If we'd started earlier, we'd, we'd be in even better shape. So this is, this is what our success stories look like right now in the Great Plains. That's what success looks like. Uh, clearly, we want more of these stories. So let's go to the next one. Because we have where they've managed, we can actually track how, what that means to this ecoregion where the bearing beetle resides. So each of these big purple circles, that's where you have more beetles. Notice in the red, you don't have beetles. Notice in the blue, you have beetles. 87% of the beetles occur either in the blue or where landowners are managing. So beetles to the eastern portion of this range can thank ranchers for halting the woody transition. Right? This is like precision, man, precision agriculture for rangelands. We don't have to manage everywhere but we do want to manage to avoid woody plants from being everywhere. This is a great example of that. So yeah, incredible result, an incredible outcome. Next slide. Not only that, 
Uh, not only have we seen where they've halted this, this rare uh, and achieved this rare success of halting a regional transition tied to woody encroachment, we've done field studies where uh, on their private lands and actually tracked that they have 2,900 pounds per acre more forage as a result of how they're managing. Uh, that is dollars in their pocket. 87% uh, of the endangered American bearing beetle, based on long-term data from Game and Parks, is in the areas that are more intact because of their management. In addition, wildfire danger has been reduced because they're putting it back into rangeland instead of in the most volatile woody plant we have in the Great Plains. And finally, this link with school funding because of the impacts that has to grazing revenue and our social programs. These are outcomes. Right? This is what happens when we keep rangeland, rangeland. It's not just the rancher. It's not just our wildlife. It is natural disasters and it's social programs. This is what we can do when we go from outputs to outcomes more broadly. So I'm hoping that that's where we keep moving towards um, as Working Lands for Wildlife uh, moves to a more Great Plains Grasslands initiative. Okay, so uh, let's go to the next one, Jeremy. I think uh, that uh, this, is, this is the other side of the coin. The Les Canyons, the communications have been incredible. Uh, they've been a lesson learned story and cautionary tale that's being told over and over again now. And, and so we have the ability not only to quantify outcome, we have the ability to communicate it. And I think this has been a missing piece of, uh, of, the, of the science of our agencies, of our landowners, where we really need to do more communications of why what we're doing matters, especially in rangelands. Um, so, so we've been doing that. I think it really mirrors what Sage Grouse Initiative is known for, but, but it's the producer story that captures the hearts and minds of our region. We're 97% or more private land. We need to tell the story from the eyes of the producer and then leverage our own values uh, to that. That's how we're gonna really expand and build more cultural will and take care of this threat. So I'll turn it back over to you at this point. Uh, Jeremy, I think, oh my gosh, one more slide. Yeah, I'm glad that this is here. Uh, I often get the question, how in the world do we go bigger? Like, I'm, I guess what I'm ready to say is that in talking with landowners, they are ready to think through how to actually create more intact systems that are not compromised by seed sources. How they, this, these are the groups that want to be guardians of the grasslands. Uh, and just look at the acres. This is without this initiative. Just wait until we get this rolling with our field offices, with our partners, I mean, we're talking about creating core areas that are not compromised by cedar anymore. Uh, it, it's incredible, the acres and cultural will and motivation. And we've just had some nice brief conversations in Oklahoma with groups, but this is how we protect our last grasslands, right? Uh, we do not have guardians of the grasslands. We have, we have no agency that, that actually protects grasslands just for the sake of grasslands. We have that for forests. We have that for other things, but we don't protect grasslands just to have them. Uh, when we tap into the ranching community and cultural will there, what I'm seeing is that they're ready to scale up with us. So I just want to paint this picture. We, we are fortunate to have a private land science and groups are ready to scale up to a bigger scale than we've been in the past. Uh, that to me is this missing link that we, that we want to tackle as part of this initiative. So thanks, that's kind of a cool success story, a cool direction that we could head. Um, Jeremy, I know you've got something real equiv equivalent uh, out in your part of the world. Yeah, thanks, Darak. That just gets me super fired up about what we're embarking on here. But let's take a trip out west and talk about how this challenge is unfolding there in the sagebrush biome. I'll give a little bit of background on the problem as Duroc did in our region here, uh, we've seen a two to six fold increase in species like pinion pine, juniper, uh, dug fir, and other conifers since the 1800s. And as conifers move in, sagebrush moves out. Um, similar story in terms of reduction of uh, understory grasses, forbs, and shrubs as, as in the plains. We've seen a rates of expansion and infill of about a half a percent to one and a half percent per year. And 90% of that expansion has occurred at the expense of adjacent sagebrush shrublands. And what's at stake? 350 species 
of wildlife and plants that depend on this sagebrush sea, one of the biggest, largest intact um, dark places uh, left in the world. And um, of course, that's the predominant land use of working, ranching, livestock production. So I'm going to actually walk through two examples, two different scales of examples. And I'm going to start with um, giving you a little bit of first person history. I was a state biologist for NRCS um, 10 years ago when we started this idea of a sage grouse initiative. And so I was really doing what you're doing now. Um, those of you on this call that uh, you know, are charged with kind of thinking about how to tackle these, I'm gonna tell you my story and what we did as a partnership in that state. Um, so this really started for us with the critter. Um, it was sage grouse and a question of uh, how could we use the farm bill to um, achieve some measurable results? Uh, we knew that that species was um, being considered for protection under ESA and that NRCS and landowners uh, stood in a unique position of being able to do something about it um, with our public land partners. And um, so we really focused in on this issue of woodland expansion. Again, most of that issue for us here is a species called Western Juniper. Um, but it plays out in this same uh, story of, of, you know, through time after invasion, proceeding from a shrubland, changing to a woodland. And so we knew that we had a large problem with that in the state. It impact, we had a pretty good idea of how it impacted grouse. And we said, you know, let's really focus our cannons and see if we can make a difference on that. So we, uh, NRCS really started this conversation with um, our state wildlife agency, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. So we didn't have a massive partnership on day one. We, we started with a couple of leaders. It was our state conservationist, Ron Alvarado, and the director of the Fish and Game that said, hey, let's put our heads together on something. And so what we roughed out at the time was, um, you know, a strategy based on sage grouse, which occupy, you know, some, most of Southeast Oregon. That's an area of about 18 million acres. And we knew that that was far too big of an area to manage. And so um, we said, what do we know about the critter that could help us focus our management? Well, we count breeding grounds called lex every year, and those lex provide data on population abundance. But we also knew that most of our uh, hens nest within three miles of those leks. So they breed on the lek and then they go off into suitable habitat for nesting. And that part of their life cycle is really important for recruiting more young chicks into the population over time. And so uh, that habitat, that seasonal habitat, is super important. And so we, we took that little dot on the map called a lek and we buffered it by three miles. And that's what you're seeing in gray. It's kind of our first wildlife stronghold, if you want to call it that. We said those might be places where if we did something there, we'd have a disproportionate impact. But it narrowed it down a little bit, but you can see that's still a pretty good chunk of their range. So then we leaned on our universities and our uh, ARS experts in the state who had really been thinking through this juniper expansion problem for a lot of years. They had laid out some really great resources about how succession happens and defined some phases that are now very common language out here in the West. Uh, we talk about these phase one, two, and three stands. And from their science, you know, they were saying, look, if you wait till phase three where trees are dominant you will have already lost your shrubs and severely reduced your perennial grasses and forbs. And so really you got to get on it early. And we talk about, you know, prioritizing these kind of phase one and two areas. So with that knowledge at the time, we created a strategy, a lot like what you're doing now. Uh, that at that time we didn't have great spatial data. Um, and so we used really coarse land fire data, they called it, 
that was like a best guess at where uh, low cover juniper might be. And that's what you're seeing here in the red. So we took that and snapped that to the sage grouse lek buffers. And the, the intersection of that um, is a little bit more refined map that shows you where important grouse habitats are, those, those strongholds we wanted to target, and where uh, the threat was still early enough. Like we had intact habitats, but it was starting to become a problem. So that really gave us our first target there in the state. Um, and so we went from an 18 million acre range to about 800,000 acres where we really wanted to focus that management to bolster uh, breeding habitats where the birds still occur. Um, and so what I wanna, I guess, instill in you is don't wait for the perfect map to get started. Um, some of this gets roughed out on napkins and you know we're just, it's that mental model, that strategic mindset that's really the most important piece. So with that information, we rolled out this initiative, again, starting with the two lead, lead partners, and uh, we rallied the troops. So, you know, here's a great shot of our, our staff, our district conservationists, soil cons, our leadership, area conservationists and whatnot. And, and we brought our team together across multiple counties and said, you know, rather than every county inventing everything on their own, inventing new spec sheets, inventing uh, outreach materials, on and on and on, let's check in with one another. And we did that quarterly. We had quarterly calls where we just said, hey, uh, what are our needs? What, what have you developed? What are you seeing, you know, in terms of landowner response? What do we need to do next? And we did that um, for years. Still, that still occurs with the leadership there in Oregon. And through that process, we learned a lot um, from our staff about how to deliver this. And I'll, I'll never forget when one of our staff um, came to me and said, hey, you know, you want us to get ahead of this problem, but our equip practice payment scenario, the only one we have pays for like, you know, moderate infestations at over $100 an acre, which, you know, we just can't really pass the red face test with landowners when you pay them $100 an acre to treat, a, you know, trees you can barely see above the shrubs. And so we, we said, instead of saying, well, we threw our hands up, we're done. We went to our programs and folks and our economists and said, we need a new payment scenario. And we created one uh, here, you know, that's for hand tools. It's like 17 bucks an acre. You know, it's really designed for people to walk around that landscape with a chainsaw or loppers and get those early trees before they get to that seed bearing stage. So um, that was kind of one of those big breakthroughs of, you know, we can ad adapt the programs and our practices to meet the outcomes we want on the ground. Along the way, we got better maps and, and improved our delivery. So about 2013, 2014, we started to get, you know, um, higher resolution remote sensing of tree cover. Our wildlife agencies started to define what they called core areas that are now what form our priority areas for conservation. Uh, the teams, the partnership grew. You know, we had huge numbers of partners now sitting down to talk about this. And so there were action areas with very specific goals to find. But the chainsaw has never stopped running. Okay, so it wasn't like we just stopped, hit pause, reinvented everything. We just kept going and we, we turned the Titanic slowly to where we needed to and we just kept adjusting to make sure um, we were using the best information we had at the time. So now I wanna step down into how this played out locally in like one community. Um, and I specifically wanna take you down to like South Central Oregon in uh, the Warner Mountains landscape. This is a hot spot for sage grouse. If you look at the map on the right, um, one of the highest density areas for sage grouse in the entire range and certainly in the Great Basin, but it's under threat, it's vulnerable. And I really wanna start with uh, a story about uh, John O'Keefe. John O'Keefe is a rancher and a leader in Oregon Cattlemen's and some of the NCBA and other groups. Um, Todd Forbes, Bureau of Land Management. Public lands are also a big deal down here and comprise a large proportion of our landscape. 
but ranchers like John operate across private and public lands. They lease those public lands to have a whole ranching operation. And so uh, when we launched the initiative and said, hey, here's what we'd like to do, we reached out to people like John and um, our local district conservationist there, Max Corning, you know, had that relationship with those producers to say, hey, can we get your help in uh, targeting this landscape and getting other landowners to adopt this type of work, right? So you reach out to those local landowner leaders um, to help you out. So I'll never forget, we, we went down one day, uh, John had set up a meeting, he reserved the, the Irish Catholic Church, one of the only structures in Adel, Oregon, and invited all of his neighbors to come and learn about this new um, effort to address juniper expansion that we happened to call the Sage Grouse Initiative. And so we went down there and like a good government employee, we had our packets, you know, our NRCS folders, all these handouts, you know, nicely organized. Well, you know, some snacks, everything was ready to go. We show up and we were there probably three hours and we had one other person show up. And I, and, and I was kind of hanging my head down low and I'll never forget John come up and said, now, Jeremy, don't worry about it. We're going to get them on board eventually. And he took that stack of folders from me, put it in his pickup truck, and went around and delivered those personally to his neighbors and just kind of through example started doing this work and having those side conversations that perhaps other producers would never have with us. Um, on the public land side, people like Todd Forbes, a field manager, you know, these are the somehow they find a way to get stuff done in agencies that it's not always easy. He developed a great partnership, did the NEPA planning to actually treat the public lands so it, you know, it was a seamless effort across private and public. And the result of that, over the next few years, every single landowner in this 70,000 acre area signed up and treated their lands, along with our public land management partners, treating over half of the landscape, the area that actually had this uh, early invasion. So we built off of the existing intact core there where you see the sage grouse lex, the stars. Now that stuff didn't have trees, but the area around it was closing in on it. And so they pushed back that advancing edge and really open this landscape back up, returning it to shrub stuff. Just an incredible example of how, when all three components of that diagram come together, you get that, those maximum outcomes um, that we all desire. And when we add that secret sauce with co-produced science, we can truly tell the story of outcomes. So I want to give a big nod to our science advisor, Dave Noggle, who, I, you know, early on called up and said, hey, you know, we're setting up these partnership, independent science, you know, assessments of SGI. And heard you guys are going to war with Juniper. You know, is there a place we could focus and really set up a well-designed experiment to learn from this? And we ended up down in the Warners. And uh, through partnerships with a couple other universities uh, and two uh, PhD students later, here's what we've seen. We've documented a 12% increase in the population growth rate of sage grouse in the treated landscape versus a control region where no treatment was done. This is a truly well-designed study, you know, going through that rigorous peer-reviewed scientific method it's the first time we've ever shown benefits of restoration for sage grouse. Um, and we actually have very few examples for uh, other wildlife species even in the literature. So this is a huge deal to be able to show that we actually bent the curve on what we call lambda or the population growth. Rate. If we look back and just kind of put Oregon in perspective, you know, what we saw there was a over 1,400% increase in the amount of conifer removal, but it was highly targeted. It was targeted in those areas 
early invasion in those priority areas for sage grouse, trying to defend those cores. Range wide, uh, we SGI has funded over 600,000 acres of that kind of work, and our partners have matched or exceeded that. Um, uh, so we're we're seeing these really big cores start to develop um, over the last decade that we just want to continue to bolster and defend. And that gives us those outcomes for ranching, wildlife, and the general public. And we talked about not only the uh, target species improvements, but you know the forage resource that we're, we're never going to lose to invasion because we addressed it early. The water resource, it, we get 12 inches of precipitation a year on average in most of the sagebrush country. Every little drop we get counts. And so we don't wanna just send it out to the ocean too fast. We wanna keep it on the land. And then our other critters that'll never get their own initiative. Um, we wanna make sure they're being taken care of as well. And this work uh, has shown to be effective for maintaining our sagebrush obligate songbirds. When we get those kinds of outcomes, we can tell stories. We have provided our public affairs folks with a treasure trove of stories from producers of why this matters and why they're doing it. And our partners pick up on it too, um, from Beef Magazine to all the NGOs, um, you know, national news and all, all the above. Perhaps um, as important, talking with our Fish and Wildlife Service partners more about getting quote credit for our actions and landowner actions in the ESA process. That hasn't been part of the history of that review process, but that's starting to change. We're seeing our efforts actually being cited as part of the reason why these species um, no longer warrant uh, ESA protection. So just kind of to wrap up, you know, both the Great Plains and the sagebrush biome, what made them ex successful? Well, it starts with leadership and cultural will. In all of those examples, we have these incredible people step forward and I can, you can name the names of those individuals who you knew were difference makers in launching those efforts. They also developed a strategic approach to get ahead of the threat. Um, and they found that sweet spot to achieve both outcomes for ranching and wildlife. This isn't just a critter initiative, it's truly a shared vision. They're adapting practices and programs to achieve the, the end product, the outcome. And we had a motivated, uh, diverse motivated um, cross-section of landowners, staff, partners to, to take it to scale. And then finally, you know, if we want outcomes, they don't measure themselves. And so we've got to team up with our scientists, our, our research community and institute this co-production model where we're working together to assess the outcomes of what we're doing and inform our delivery going forward. And so with that, uh, I am now gonna pass it back to you, Duroc. We're gonna ask the question of, we've done some really great things. How can we take that information and do even better as we move forward in our strategy development? Awesome, Jeremy. Uh, this, is, this is the question I kept getting over and over again. Um, how, do we, how do we have more success? And, and I tell you, this was something that was a challenge just because of, of how we view uh, questions in the science and how to look at it. So finally it hit us. I mean, like a, it just like a light bulb went off of, of we, are, we are viewing this system backwards. We're viewing it from, the, from you know, after these big state transitions happen, after we have, you know, encroachment occurring instead of viewing it from the lens of our grasslands. So, so like we need to think of encroachment like every other invasive species that spreads into what we want to protect. So this is actually what the invasion process looks like. You have an intact grassland. So what ha happens? Well, at some point there's a nearby seed source and that nearby seed source delivers the cone. That's the reproductive pathway. You know, Jeremy always says invasion 101. Well, 
what do we do with, with every other species? We try and prevent spread and the reproductive pathway. If we can cut off reproduction, we can better win. So, so that is when the encroachment process starts. It does not start when we have mature trees spreading. It starts when we have dispersal of seed because that causes reproduction and recruitment of seedlings. So we don't even detect this on the ground usually until it escapes that herbaceous layer, right? We, we don't see the seedlings hidden in the, the grass uh, trap. And then all of a sudden, uh, by the time we detect it, we have mature reproducing seed bearing plants. That's how far we are behind the invasion pathway and the invasion curve. So I just wanna walk down like, what happens if we actually start to attack this earlier and earlier? Well, what are grasslands? Like if I'm thinking of it from my part of the world, grasslands are treeless, they're treeless at large scales, and they do not have incoming seed. Those are the good old days of rangeland management, right? We can do improvements uh, for grazing and infrastructure because our system is stable, it is intact, and it is not threatened by this major problematic encroaching species. The good old days of management. Well, we have a resource concern as soon as we start popping into the, the encroachment process, right? Like, think of it like zebra mussels. We want to prevent zebra mussels coming into lakes, not have to restore zebra mussel infested lakes. So when we have dispersal coming in, our grasslands, even though they look treeless, they're now compromised by seed. Well, our management philosophy should be high maintenance boundary management because our grasslands now have a threat that's emerged into them. So this is a really great new approach. We should be managing dispersal when and where we can and think of it as a boundary. Think of all this spatially. These are the new principles of how we could manage woody encroachment better. Well, all of a sudden then you get to recruitment. This is the seedling phase. So what do we have by the time we have young seedlings that can't reproduce? Well, that's early successional brush. We have immature seedlings present. What should be our philosophy? Well, that's classical early detection, rapid response. If we wait until the next phase, we're under encroachment. So now we have reproducing individuals spreading and now it's taken off. So I view this as often a management trap and a game of risk. Uh, and finally, you get to state transitions. This is where the system's totally changed. So if you click this, Jeremy, and go forward, you can see how we split apart reactive versus more proactive approaches. Uh, that's the line. More proactive phases prevent the reproduction pathway from taking off. So click it one more time for me. And so view that as a giant warning sign. If we can prevent reproduction, we can start getting ahead of this more. That's something that we haven't really emphasized with technical guidance. We haven't studied it that way in the science. I mean, there are not papers on how to strongly manage dispersal from Eastern red cedar and other types of conifers like that. All right, let's move forward. So these key principles, one of the biggest ones I just wanna briefly comment on is that this is the myth of restoration. This is how we've approached it so much. What's the effect of a mechanical removal of a cedar dominated or other conifer dominated state? It does not go back into an intact system. It just doesn't happen. This is kind of how we, we often view it, but it's, but it's just wishful thinking. This is not realistic. Uh, go to the next slide. In reality, what we have is we have seed. So it's in the dispersal phase. The most likely outcome of a single restoration is that it goes right back to a juniper-dominated state. Not an intact state. It goes back to a juniper-dominated one. Uh, here's an example just to illustrate of a 2002 Gothenburg wildfire in uh, South Central Nebraska. So everywhere red is more dominated by cedar, everywhere blue more dominated by grass. There's your wildfire perimeter. So there's 2001, click to 2002. Well, the wildfire, of course, reset the system. But you can see what it missed, right? It didn't burn the stuff that is on the perimeter. You see all the small red patches and you see a bunch of these yellow patches. Well, watch how it recovers, right? It used to be a cedar state. It's got that memory. It goes back in. So now jump to 2018. It spreads from a seed source. It spread from what the wildfire missed. And because we didn't do anything afterwards, 
we now lost the opportunity that this disturbance gave us. So the most likely outcome of single restoration is it goes right back to what we don't want. This is, we haven't, we haven't communicated the problem this way. I think this is one of the big outcomes we could do. And this is what it looks like in 2018. All right, next slide. So Jeremy always talks about it this way. Jeremy, you want to give your anecdote here? I always like how you refer to how we, that way of thinking. Yeah, sure. I mean, I actually stole this from a friend of mine, Chad Boyd at ARS is constantly thinking big, bigger than our normal perspective. And, you know, we often do these uh, local projects, right? And we have these beautiful before and afters of a patch being, quote, restored. But what we fail to do is look up around us and notice that the actual house is on fire. Um, so, you know, some of the stuff we, we do, we really need to question, um, you know, what's the landscape context and that this is happening in? Are we actually getting ahead of the problem or just kind of doing some temporary fixes? So, yeah, that's kind of a, just a great analogy and something to keep in mind. Yeah, I always like that, especially, you know, when I was in Texas for so long, there was a quote when I was in a meeting with uh, some professors and ranchers there where, you know, while we've been doing brush management, you know, they've sold the ranch three times to pay for brush management because it keeps coming back so fast. So it's, it's almost like the house keeps burning down and we keep rearranging furniture. Uh, so yeah, I really like that metaphor and it just shows that challenge of a reactive approach. We're just in a perpetual reaction stage at that point. So let's go forward and let's see what it would take um, based on how the process actually encroaches. So if you're here in this more dominated woody state, we're talking about going back to a dispersal phase because there's seed that was there. Well, we have to implement management that causes seed bank depletion. And that is the result of preventing mature trees from establishing over time. Seed bank depletion is absolutely possible. We have a number of groups talking about it. Uh, one of those groups is in South Central Kansas, where after the 2016 Anderson Creek wildfire, it killed a lot of cedar, but, but just like Gothenburg wildfire, it left a lot. Well, how can we actually build off of that and start to deplete, deplete the seed bank? It is absolutely possible if we become more strategic in how we manage it. I think, Jeremy, you had, a, you had the Idaho example, too, that you were telling me about. Yeah, that photo there on the left from my, my buddy Connor White with Pheasants Forever um, on the Burley Project in Idaho. There, he sent me these really cool examples of uh, capitalizing on wildfires. So you can see the thick uh, phase three woodland in the background on the hills and the sharp lines of where the fire ended. But, uh, you know, they're taking this opportunity to leverage that initial intervention of a, a natural wildfire and push this system on a better path. And so they're scouring that landscape, cutting anything that survived and uh, getting rid of the skeleton so it's not a raptor perching haven for, um, for the future so that sage grouse could someday return here. So just something I hadn't really thought a lot about, but maybe um, an opportunity for us in sagebrush country to be thinking more about. Yeah, and I think the, the opportunity is here as well. We just we've managed this problem without thinking about where babies come from tied to conifers. And this is, this is the reality. If we can manage some of that seed, uh, boy, we can prevent that recovery that's more rapid and, and uh, preventing it from going to that condition that we don't want. So let's go forward. Like, uh, let's say that you, you don't have that capability to get it back to a more intact uh, system that has no incoming seed. Uh, go ahead and move that slide forward, Jeremy. Well, then you're in the dispersal phase. So here's a picture of an example in Nebraska where you have a, a, a windbreak or a patch of cedar trees there. And, and so you have a system that's compromised by seed. Well, we've, we've looked at the literature and we're starting to study this more. Most of the effective recruitment is within a football field of the seed source. So all of a sudden it's like, wait a minute, this isn't infinite. We can manage this. We can manage seed dispersal. But the only thing that can do that is prescribed fire. Nothing else consumes a seed before it becomes a seedling. And this is an important point to step back now and say, that's why conifers that don't resprout hate fire. The history of range science, you see it over and over again, where we said fire was a tool in the toolbox. 
Well, not if we understand the encroachment process. Fire is literally the only one that manages each phase of the encroachment process. That's what made it unique. Now we can, we can diversify our management strategy and we can use multiple tools, but that's what makes fire absolutely unique is it can do all this at once. Uh, it can kill large trees, it can kill seedlings, it can consume seed, but we also wanna watch out for seeds escaping the fire trap and all of a sudden leading to mature trees that cause that invasion to spread. Uh, that's why this high maintenance boundary management, you're trying to prevent seedlings. So that way you're not having to make the costly restoration again. Okay, go forward one more. This is the one that's real common that also prevents, right, reproduction from happening. So the loppers, and what you're doing is you're keeping it in that recruitment to dispersal phase uh, because often you have a nearby seed source or potentially you're doing this long enough, preventing any mature seed bearing trees from happening. Maybe we can even get back to an intact system. So loppers really treat the seedlings. So we're in this middle phase, but it's riskier, right? This invasion process is progressing. It's a little riskier, but it is highly effective if we think how to do this spatially and we think about encroachment process. All right, next one. So as we, as we think through these principles, there's your warning, right? That's the, you wanna prevent mature reproduction at all costs, because then we start getting behind the eight ball. And, and go to the next slide, Jeremy. I think this is a great example of this. Uh, as we start thinking of this, uh, we start moving towards a game of risk. Um, in fact, Jeremy and I even had a debate. I view, I view this as almost mission impossible in the Great Plains. If we are going to wait until uh, they reproduce, our rate of encroachment is so fast and our rate of recovery is so fast and the scale of the amount of land we need to manage is so expansive, this might be mission impossible. This is what we've often done that, and, and that's why our biomes also slip. Um, Jeremy has other examples, of course, because it's so much slower of an encroachment rate out west uh, due to aridity and soil differences. Um, but this, again, I view it kind of like the game of risk. Like the more we can work upstream, the better. But there's lots of cases where, of course, we want to work there and, uh, and try and keep it in this kind of encroachment trap. Yeah, the, the debate we have, you know, Duroc, is um, in our part of the world, like this site here, uh, what we'd call phase two, it's got those reproducing mature trees. But it also still supports really important browse like sagebrush and bitter brush that are mule deer and sage grouse depend on. So, you know, we have these values that are worth protecting and uh, fire has consequences too in terms of invasive species like cheatgrass. And so we're kind of stuck. It is a little bit riskier, but we, we do have this time on our side issue. And I, it didn't hit me until I went out to the sand hills with you a couple of years ago and we were standing there looking at eastern red cedar. It was like, you know, seven or eight foot tall tree. And we're like, how long did it take to get that tall? And, you know, oh, you know, just a few years. And I said a tree that tall in my part of the world it would take 40 or 50 years. So we, we have um, a window in the Intermountain West that you may not have in, in the cedar country. Yeah, and I think that's what provides this context, right? Like these are, these are key principles and we know that the solutions are gonna be local. Um, and, and what this does is hopefully it gives the biology, here's the biology of this problem and how it actually works in reality. How can you all manage it to meet certain values and goals given local context? Uh, I think this is something we haven't had. This, is, this should, especially if we think of this spatially. So yeah, great. I think that's a great antidote, Jeremy. Uh, I think usually we all agree, let's avoid the state transition. This is where we see that major degradation that we want to avoid uh, and not wait to act when we hit that phase of the process. Okay, so let's go to the next one. So, so what we talked about, notice that everything that we were at before started on the left side of that picture, right? It was dominated by conifers. So, so we can either do this the easy way or we can do this the hard way, right? If we wait to start where there's conifers, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge. Um, but if we, if we manage this earlier, it's easier. Uh, 
I mean, if we keep, and we need to do this, we cannot manage every single acre with loppers across the Great Plains. We have to keep significant areas intact. And that's what Dave Noggle earlier said was the best indicator of an umbrella. How intact are our rangelands? So, so we need intact systems that are not compromised by seed. Uh, how can we do that? So I'm gonna quickly walk you through it. Uh, it becomes so much easier. So here's an example from the eastern side of the Nebraska Sandhills, a classic one. Here's a windbreak with encroachment happening. And I want you to think about all of this spatially because all these phases are happening at once. This windbreak and all that represents kind of the state transition that was man-made uh, in an area that was historically grassland. Well, how do we work from the core out? Well, if you might, here's this box, see that aerial photograph, that box on the right of the windbreak? That's an area that is treeless, it has no seedlings, but it has incoming seed because it's next to seed sources. That's an area traditionally we, we don't think of telling people to work. Uh, well, one of the best things we could do is start thinking of how to prevent the establishment of seedlings, prevent that encroachment process from taking off. So we might do high maintenance boundary management with fire so that we have no seedlings. And think of this to producers. I can't make the science any easier for a target. Your target is no seedlings. Now you might even go to an intact rangeland, which people are doing some places in the sand hills and saying, wait a minute, I don't need that windbreak anymore. It doesn't serve what it used to serve and I wanna remove the risk. Oh, well, we've just removed the source of the problem. Uh, others, I want my outdoor barn. I just don't want it to eat my whole lunch. Okay, well, you've got a high maintenance boundary. Okay, so let's go to the next one. What happens in another area on this site? Well, down in the Southwest corner, we actually have seedlings that no remote sensing product can pick up. They are hidden in the herbaceous layer, which we've started doing work on. Well, what do we want to not happen? Well, we want no seed bearers because that dispersal distance starts to move and now we have to manage more area. So no seed bearers is the target. Well, that's where we use loppers or prescribed fire or haying, anything that keeps it in that trap, right? Early detection, rapid response. And then you have mature encroachment happening, you know, further north of that box. So the point is you can start to spatially implement this strategy to keep as much areas intact as possible and the more percentage of our landscape that is intact that requires no management sure is better than if we're having to manage more and more acreage that's gone through this encroachment process. That's how we can have a whole lot less ambulances on the landscape and start having a whole lot more blue in this picture. So this is absolutely possible. We just haven't thought of it this way. We haven't communicated it this way. And that includes the science and how we've approached it. Okay, next slide. Jeremy, you want right. to take it over? Yep, absolutely. Thanks. Um, so just a, a quick acknowledgement here that, you know, what we're talking about is um, very specifically on conifer expansion processes. Um, but that same thought process and in invasion ecology applies to these other species, um, mesquite, cheatgrass. And so just we may not have all of the same figures and the, the processes uh, specked out like with these examples, but just know that if you're struggling with those types of problems as well, we can apply this same mindset um, to, to tackling them. So again, back to this question of um, how can we improve going forwards? Well, you know, one of them is uh, getting at the how and what the, the practices and programs that you're going to use in, in the, your delivery of the effort and what you'll enter into the database portal. Um, you know, be thinking about an expansion upon our traditional practices and tools. And so I think about things like, you know, are we equipped to use uh, loppers or do early intervention? Um, do we have monitoring uh, available to us that would incentivize producers to actually get on this problem before we have those seed bearers? And then, you know, are we employing the full suite of our programs to get there? You know, knowing that this isn't a one and done situation. If we do have trees, you're going to have multiple interventions. And so how do we accomplish that? We also need to improve by 
engaging more people and that's either producers in these communities and many of them are ready to have that conversation or in the west it's our public land partners you know how can we be successful when private lands um, are are checkerboarded with public lands you can't address this issue without that holistic approach and then finally what we're talking about here is just bringing it all together the concepts of invasion science the new spatial strategy and the, the core the idea of identifying cores and defending those with an expanded toolbox um, hopefully will equip us for the next decade of trying to better halt these large-scale state transitions that are happening so now we're going to shift over and i'll give it back to you Dirac, to talk specifically like step by step you know how how do we build these strategies? Yeah, so with this charge, and you've seen a little bit of this this morning, um, and uh, as Jeremy and I have talked through it, this is something that we've actually uh, been working on with different producer groups, with some people, but, and this was kind of the lesson learned. So, so we can take and identify now where these leading edges of where grasslands are winning and where trees are winning, Where's that boundary at? Because remember, like, look at that Sand Hills boundary. If you're in the red, your management changed now compared to what it was last decade. If you're in the blue, how close are you to that expansion that's coming your direction? You're, you're vulnerable, even though on your site, you have no trees. So, so understanding where you are in this expansion is so critical. And, and then you can identify with things like the rangeland analysis platform, other kinds of tools, where do you have your intact grassland areas relative to that invasion process? So, so you can see how much of that grassland area we have intact relative to the location of the threat that's moving in. And then you take field inventory data because we can't see everything with remote sensing, other expert knowledge on the ground, other data products, and, uh, and really start to refine our knowledge set. And what we're trying to do here is identify our core areas that we wanna protect and push back against, just like the stories of the Warner Mountains and the Les Canyons. Uh, of course, it's working lands for wildlife. So by doing that, we're protecting rangeland yield from being lost, and we're protecting our wildlife resources. So where are your wildlife priorities relative to all this? Uh, and where do you need to put those bullets in the system? Uh, and where do you have the cultural will to act? Where do you have landowners ready to act? And this is you can't map that. That's where we want to tap in to the local field offices and, and NRCS and partner relationships and really bring these together. Finally, we can co-produce better solutions, more customized solutions, and get ahead of this problem, track outcomes, adapt over time, and grow success. And this is kind of a nice roadmap for how we see we can better manage this big scale threat. Okay, next slide. So this is, I just want to create an example because there's more and more groups that just, they don't want to fight every day their whole lives against cedar or other woody plants in the future. So we see an opportunity to scale up. We see opportunities and landowners are ready. They're, they're talking in areas of the Great Plains on how we could make this easier. How could we defend cores? And, and man, one incredible example that I had the pleasure to participate in was with this group of landowners in the Gypsum Hills of South Central Kansas. And just look at that map, like in 2015 versus 2018, that's what the wildfire did there. And then these groups have just been really proactive of wanting to figure out how to get cedar back where they want it and make this easier. So all of a sudden you have this area here that could be a core. I mean, we're talking about the expansion and growth of a core that's on hundreds of thousands or potentially millions of acres in one spot. Uh, the cultural will in some of these areas is there. We, we shouldn't discount how ready ranchers are to tackle the woody encroachment problem in the Great Plains. I think this is just one incredible example. Um, and I think a lot of opportunity to see how big and how successful we could make this in the future here in the Great Plains. All right, next slide. So, so for next steps, this is, I just like this as kind of a calling card. Identify priority areas of where we can work. We want to establish cores, build them, defend them, grow them. 
we really want to put the right practice in the right place. And we've got to start doing it at the right scale if we're going to match the scale of the threat. That'll really require adapting our practices to, to really get ahead of the problem instead of chasing it. And, and that can even include better just communication and technical guidance to where we're being more realistic of what people can expect instead of like the wishful thinking that we hope that they'll follow up on the initial investment. Um, and dream big, you know, just like that example, the Gypsum Hills, there's the opportunities that exist across Great Plains states to dream big and have big conservation areas that benefit ranching and wildlife. Uh, that requires cultural will. And if we don't have it yet, we can build it. Uh, I've been so impressed with some of this guardians of the grasslands discussion. Uh, there's a lot of desire to keep grasslands grasslands. Um, so yeah, I think that's kind of just some talking points that here in the plains we'll keep coming back to. All right, Jeremy, thanks for that opportunity to showcase this stuff. I'll give it back to you. Perfect, thank you. Uh, so I'll wrap up with um, what'll look to be a very similar roadmap for folks in sagebrush country and maybe even for those in the Southwest thinking about um, incorporating this into your watershed uh, planning. You know, what we're, uh, our process might look a little different. We've got um, good maps of conifer cover across the West that are available to us. And I'll show you those on wrap. Um, we've got good uh, wildlife stronghold information in our sage grouse priority areas for conservation. So we're gonna snap those two things together to help us focus. And then we wanna use our, our local knowledge, the people on this call and people you're gonna reach out to as well to incorporate actual field conditions because there's only so much you can map re remotely. Uh, and where are people ready to do this stuff? So um, use that information and draw on your kind of big broad polygons of, yeah, we're gonna hit that spot right there and, you know, in this landscape. Um, of course, we want to engage partners um, on the public land side too, especially so that we're ensuring our treatments are uh, actually achieving, you know, um, those outcomes we want, stopping that invasion process, not just being patch cuts in a sea of public land. And then we've got um, very specific types of actions you might want to think about doing depending on which area you're in. And of course, we're ready to help track outcomes and, and help tell the story once we know where those geographies are. And we're building on our success over the last decade. Um, I wanna pat everybody on the back who's from sagebrush country and made this happen. Uh, it, it was incredible to watch this agency um, do something highly targeted and effective. And we just published a study in SRM's range ecology and management, looking at uh, remote sensing of conifer reduction over that time frame, and we can measure outcomes from space. We're seeing the impact of that reduced conifer footprint where we targeted management, and we're also better understanding the role of wildfire. We still have a tremendous amount of fire in this part of the world. In fact, about a third of all the conifer reduction still happens because of wildfire, and so again, maybe an opportunity there to continue to push those sites in the right direction. So I've been called the shade hater in our part of the world. I think about this stuff maybe too much, um, but here's just some thoughts, you know, based on what I've seen, uh, my interactions with a lot of you, and then with the rock. I think what we're talking about doing in this next phase for SGI in particular is completing those treatments in previous priority areas. So you may have some additional work that you want to clean up um, and you'd already know about those. I'm also thinking about what more can we do to defend those intact core landscapes that we created? Are there seed bank depletion opportunities? Can we go back in with loppers now and get anything that we missed previously, right? Because we're not using prescribed fire much because we lose that sagebrush component and we have a cheatgrass risk. If, and if that's the case, then we need to be vigilant that that seed source is still there and uh, perhaps there's an opportunity to uh, deplete that before they get to mature reproducing plants. And then of course, there'll be new priority areas that you may want to identify, new cores, um, perhaps 
connectivity between packs, you know, some areas where we're growing those cores or uh, snapping into additional seasonal habitats like, you know, that late brood rearing stuff that, you know, we know is so important now. And some, some communities may be ready today that weren't before. So where's that cultural will um, now ready to focus uh, investment? And then finally, this post-fire rehab mentality, I'm really starting to think more and more about, can we capitalize on wildfire to put in an additional intervention that really manages that seed source so that that site eventually recovers to a shrub and grassland system. So just to wrap up, remember the charge. Um, we're looking for these polygons, you know, it don't overcomplicate it. Uh, big course, you know, highlighters and crayons exercises work just fine to identify a target, spitball some estimates of what you're going to need to do it. And, uh, you know, that's kind of a big part of this equation is finding that sweet spot. Now, one last thing I want to show you before I turn it over to Danielle for questions is the, the spatial data that's available. So I'm going to actually exit this and um, show you on the wrap. Brady mentioned this earlier. Uh, if you go to the rangeland analysis platform, you're going to see these new tabs here that uh, if you go to sagebrush conservation, for example, there's new data in this toolbox that's specific for this exercise. So if you turn on categorical tree cover, you'll have at your fingertips this map of tree cover and we've binned it up so it's a little bit easier to understand um, and see patterns. Uh, and we have it through time, in this case, back to 1984, you can kind of zoom in and check out some areas. We've got a couple of reference layers here, like the packs that will help you um, maybe dial in and have some geographic reference. And so, you know, use this tool to help um, discuss with your partners what you might want to do. Um, also, I'll just go ahead and cover this, Duroc. We've got the same type of data sets here for the Great Plains folks. Um, categorical tree cover that he showed you before, and then also the woody transitions layer where you can see the leading edge or the early warning indicators of, of that transition happening. So uh, Duroc and I are available to help you guys with um, kind of your local conversations. So please reach out to us if you have questions about that. And then, uh, you know, the data here can all be downloaded if you have GIS experts that wanna work with this. But as was mentioned in the first morning session, these data sets are really large. So um, feel free to reach out to our team as well if, if you need help in exporting a particular area or something. So with that, I'm, I know we're running short on time. I wanna get back to you, Danielle, and see if there are any questions. We do have one that has come in. Um, so uh, do higher grass, does higher grass cover keep out cedar seeds and seedlings. Yes. Yeah, that's a off. <laughs> happy to give a brief answer. Um, we think so, but but it's been so limited in its study uh, that that we don't really have great science on it. But but yeah, in general, we tend to think so. It's something that just requires a whole lot more research than what's been done to this point. So one idea is that you create uh less competition with grass and trees right if if the grass is shorter and there's less biomass so it's easier for cedar to escape that grass competition but not much on it 